I am going to talk to you about the ways composers tell us things through their music and at different levels. We can look for signs and we can discover symbols and even secrets. I speak as a composer from the inquiring mind of a composer and from the interests of a composer. But in these talks I will tell you about such things as love and lust, about religion and secret societies, about friendship, jealousy and hatred, about politics in times of oppression and about personal repression, and all told to us through the language of music. But music can be an enigma, and cracking that enigma code can be very complicated, because each and every composer finds their own method of embedding their innermost thoughts in their music. Of course, composers might want to tell us a story in an open and honest way, Richard Strauss's Alpine Journey, for instance, or his representation of Nietzsche's writings. Liszt's depictions of Dante, or Berlioz's Witch's Sabbath, to name but a few. But very often there are subtexts. Composers can tell us their innermost secrets, and in ways in which they can never be held up in court, for libel, for adultery, for offending ruthless politicians, for speaking the unspeakable, or just for making malign jokes of their contemporaries. Yet they may also want to give both private and shared sets of messages. There may even be things that they want us to know, and other aspects they only wish to express on an inner level. Composers' secrets. Yes, some are secrets they want us to know, some are secrets they want us to absorb, some are secrets they want to hide, but composers will inevitably shape their music with their own personal concerns. Their life, their angst, their joy, their sadness will all guide the path. Ultimately, it can become a game because it is something composers know that ultimately we could discover. Let us consider what Schumann, Bletchley Park, and the 15th century Italian Codex Voynich Manuscript, which remains a puzzle still to be solved, might have in common. First, we need a crash course in music cryptography. Eric Sams, who was born in 1926 and died in 2004, was a British musicologist and Shakespeare scholar whose brilliance earned him a scholarship to Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, at the age of 16. His lifelong passion for puzzles and ciphers saw him become a code breaker at Bletchley Park between 1944 and 1947. He was a regular contributor to the Musical Times. He's also father of the composer Jeremy Sams, who is a lyricist, playwright and theatre director, as well as being a writer of his own music. Eric Sams explains that cryptography, secret writing, includes any method of masking a message. He says, in cipher, the letters of a message are systematically transformed, either by changing their order or by replacing them with other letters or symbols. These procedures, Sam says, are akin to some aspects of music, thus key, tonality, as in C major or D minor, is a basic common concept, while pitch, for example notes and rhythm, have evident semantic or meaningful application. Indeed, music has often been conceived and described as a communication intelligible only to the initiated, which is precisely what language structures in general and cryptograms in particular are designed to be. Cryptography and music go together, and this was recognised in World War II by the British Crypto Analytic Service based at Bletchley Park. It was a typical test for a candidate to be asked if they could read an orchestral score. And it should be noted that musical symbols and or ideas should have been used in cryptography and other similar disciplines for centuries. An obvious method is to assign the letters of the alphabet to individual notes of music. I quote Eric Sams directly. He writes, The late 15th century manuscript rules for carrying on a secret correspondence by cipher, describes a musical cipher. Symbols for 24 letters and the word a, as in and, 
are formed by using five different pitches on a three-line staff and altering the stem directions and note values. The earliest documented system thereafter seems to be the analogous cipher used about 1560 by Philip II of Spain. By the end of the 16th century, some very complex systems were in practical use. Thus, the papal cryptographic service of about 1596 used a musical cipher of nine different pitches, each variable in eight ways, yielding a possible 72 symbols. And also, in 1596, a beleaguered city sent coded messages by ringing bells in a prearranged permutation. And then Sam's rightly turns to what we refer to as the Kadai method, or sometimes known as tonic solfar. You may remember the song in The Sound of Music, which brilliantly sets the sounds associated with tonic solfar, beginning with the words do a deer. Those seven sounds are do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, sometimes referred to tea, as in tea, a drink with jam and bread. But fascinatingly, Sams reveals that these can be combined to create some musical ideas, as in domi sol, i the perfect triad, to mean God, and its retrograde, reverse, in other words, form, to mean Satan. Similarly, in Italian, sola si means ascend, and si la sol means descend. The most common of all such devices, however, was the use of letter names of notes to create themes from words, or, more usually, names of people. Bach, as B-A-C-H, is a simple example used by Johann Sebastian Bach himself and many others since. At one rather jocular extreme, the composer John Field's tribute to his hostess Madame Kramer in the form of two grateful melodies based on the notes B-E-E-F and C-A-B-B-A-G-E, beef and cabbage. Does this sound simple or complicated? In effect, it is very simple, but cracking the code is the tricky bit. Let us look at this simple aspect. Let us begin with letters of the alphabet and musical notes. The musical scale runs from A to G, i.e. the octave and the subsequent repetition. So it is easy to use these notes to represent letters. However, how can composers cipher the rest of the alphabet? Historically, there have been two approaches which are generally labelled German and French methods. Let us look at the German method first. In the German-speaking word, B-flat is referred to as B, and B-natural is referred to as H, as in Bach's H-moll messer, and Trompeta in B, trumpet in B. J.S. Bach frequently used the musical cryptogram B-A-C-H, as have many other composers in reverence. Other note names have been derived from their sound. For instance, E-flat, A-S in German, can be represented as S. Bach was indeed lucky to be able to so easily transfer his full name into music. Not so other composers, though they repeatedly used whatever they could. Now we can turn to the French method. This was perhaps more sophisticated and began in the latter part of the 19th century. It's much closer to conventional enciphonment. Here is an example of the most popular method. Along the top line you see the letters A to G associated with their musical equivalents. And below you see a series of other letters. So the musical note A could respond to H, O or V. And the musical note B could equally respond to the letters I, P or W. The composer Robert Schumann used cryptograms a lot and they became increasingly complex. Easy to recognise is the use of S-C-H-A, the musical equivalents of E-flat, C, B-natural, A, 
to represent himself in works such as Carnival. Here he also uses A-S-C-H to represent the name of a friend's hometown and anagrammatized as A-S-H-C. He also uses F-A-E, standing for frei aber einsam, free but lonely. His other overt music ciphers, used in existing letters or manuscripts, including B-E-D-A, Beda, a pet name for Clara Wieck, and no doubt one of the longest examples on record, Lass das Vater, Fass das Echte, or, in English, Leave what is trite, hold fast to the right. These notes become the entire melodic line from Brebus, the eighth piece from Clavier Buchlein for Marie, written for his daughter's seventh birthday. As a composer myself that uses ciphers regularly, I can fully understand why Schumann's approach would have been so complex, simply because of the increasing possibilities he would have had. In 1909, composers such as Faure and Saint-Saëns were commissioned to write pieces using the letters B-A-D-D-G, standing for Haydn, using a combination of German and French systems. Sasson was not easily convinced by this approach and wrote, it would be annoying to get mixed up in a farcical business which would make us a laughing stock in the German musical world. While many composers encrypt their work with all those musical equivalents to letters or with numbers, many use harmony to tell us things or structures to leave profound messages. Some even write the pages of their music to make something clear or not. The way we respond to what is fundamentally musical symbolism is very different to the way a viewer responds to images or the reader responds to a written text. Music is of course an abstract medium and there are so very many languages. Indeed composers seem to create a language both collectively according to period and genre and individually according to style and intention. We the listener can be caught by music's emotions even more profoundly because we cannot easily initially grasp it. Yet we the listener cannot be sure of the immediate message. Indeed the listener may never know it, especially if that message is deeply etched as opposed to superficially grafted. Composers can also use existing music, past music, maybe their own work or maybe other composers' work to tell us something as well. This naturally relies on our knowledge of such former music. If we return briefly to Richard Strauss, we can remember how many times he quotes his earlier works in Ein Heldenleben, A Hero's Life, which he saw as a quasi-autobiographical piece. While we may initially mock such a bombastic title, there is an irony to it that makes parody at his jealous contemporaries and all those carping critics that he literally portrays in the work. Ultimately, music speaks to us all differently. It can touch our subconscious and our conscious simultaneously. And we don't even know it is doing it to us. And even if we do, we cannot explain to what extent our subconscious or conscious is being shaken. In my next talks, I will look more closely at specific works by composers ranging from Johann Sebastian Bach to the living American composer George Crumb. In the meantime, thank you for listening.